Once upon a time, there was a little boy in India who had a dream of designing a dress for the First Lady of the United States. Fast forward to 2009, and that dream became a reality for Naeem Khan when he was asked to dress First Lady Michelle Obama for her first date dinner. Hold on a second. Let's go back. You see, after Naeem grew up surrounded by textiles and fabrics in his grandfather's workshop in India, he was recruited at just 18 years old to work for world-renowned designer Halston, where he learned from cultural icons Andy Warhol, Elizabeth Taylor, and Liza Minnelli. After decades of mastering his craft, Naeem Khan has become a household name, dressing celebrities from Beyonce and Taylor Swift to Penelope Cruz and Kate Hudson. This is the story of how a little boy from India pursued the American dream and created a brand synonymous with glamour and elegance. The entrepreneurial spirit is the cornerstone of the American dream, a beacon to all willing to weave their story into the fabric of our history. I'm Elliot Dweck, and this is From the Founder. Okay, we're gonna have fun. We're gonna do this. Naeem, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me here in this beautiful office. Thank you, Elliot. It's so nice to be with you. So, let's start from the beginning. Mm -hmm. What was your earliest memory as a kid? My earliest memory as a child is growing up in India where I was born in a little village north of India. Very, very poor. And my grandfather was a worker in one of the beautiful embroidery workshops. So I have my early memories of going there when I was about three or four and being in those workshops where he used to work. So growing up and playing around in the workshop with all those yarns and the reels that the, the threads are woven on, I used to like make cars out of it. And my vivid memories are the colors, the shocking pink and the gold and all these hands that are embroidering. I mean, it's like a dream when I think of it now. My grandfather started his career working in an embroidery workshop and he was an embroiderer. He's my hero because he not only became one of the best embroiderers, that my father then took his, his legendary grandfather's work and made it bigger later on in life. Then we moved out from the village. My father then moved to a big city, knowing nobody. He stayed at his aunt's house, but he in his suitcase brought along some ideas from his father. And so he didn't have idea of any business, but he was a smart man. So he then goes to the richest area in town in Mumbai and leaves a card with the doorman, with the front guard, saying, I make the most beautiful embroideries. Whoever in this building, please give them my card. One lady called. He went to a house, showed her the samples, and she made a sari from him. And that sari was so beautiful that her, her friends wanted it. Then he made for those friends, and then those friends, and the word started to spread. When I grew up, I was a teenager and I see the success of my father. And I told my father that I want to learn fashion and I didn't want to go to school anymore. Well, why weren't you interested in school? It was so rigid that if you did anything wrong, you would be punished, where you'd be beaten. And beaten? Uh, yeah, like with the ruler <laughs> and uh, on your knuckles, you know, so or get a caning. I didn't like the way I was being educated. I think out of the box. I didn't want to be told what to do. Right. I was not interested in religion. I was not interested in education. And I wanted to run around with girls. And that was, and I didn't want to study. That was a bad, and my parents were like, okay, he's really going to put the family name down the tube. So my father was coming to America to expand his business, coming from a little town to Mumbai. Now he wanted to go to the world. And I still remember, I must have been 14 or 15, him having these conversations about how people will appreciate what we do. Look at the fabrics we make. We make the most beautiful fabrics. Let's go. Let's go to America. Let's show them the stuff. And he said, come with me so that he can, we can find a school for me. Go to fashion school. I 
came here with him to look for a school. And I was lucky enough that one fortunate day when my father went to meet a designer called Halston, and I had not been with him to any of his meetings, that one meeting I went with him. And uh, I sat across the table at Olympic Towers. I don't know if you guys have seen the documentary. And Halston and I had such a great conversation. So this is, this is Halston, the Halston, the Halston, the legendary designer Halston. Exactly. And you and your dad in a meeting. Yes. And I am 17 years old and I'm sitting across Halston and I had a big afro and uh, my father was showing him all the textiles and I'm explaining to Halston what my family does. And uh, he was like, Naeem, for your age, you know so much. And I said, well, I grew up in it. And he said, what are you doing? I said, I said, I'm going to go to school here. He said, why do you need to go to school? You have such incredible knowledge. Why don't you come work for me and become my apprentice? And I'll teach you fashion and you can teach me your world. He hands me, he was on the cover of Life magazine and he hands me the magazine. And my father and me and his business partners were going for dinner that night. And I swear to you, Elliot, I was walking with my dad on Park Avenue and we were going to a restaurant and my father and his partners were walking in the front me with my life magazine in my arm, 17 years old, in America, never been to America, looking around these tall buildings. And when I'm walking, the floor was glistening. It was the mica in the, in the street thing. My vision of that mica shining is like I had landed in a heaven and my world was going to change. And so we go to the restaurant and I tell my dad that I want to work for this man. And my dad said, no way. You are 17 years old. You need to go to school. I can, like, there's not child labor that the man has you working there. And I said, oh my God, this is like the biggest job that I'm going to get. My dad right. is not happy <laughs> with it. And I go back to India with my dad and I convince my mom that I need to go work for this man. My mom convinced my dad and I had turned 18 now. So then I come to work for Halston and I became his assistant and my life changed. What did, I'm sure you learned so much from being around Halston, Andy Warhol, Elizabeth Taylor, yeah. Liza Minnelli. Yeah, like for example, it was my first month working for Halston and uh, Halston had this idea, which you can actually see some of those dresses that Betty Ford wore. And, and there's a sh shot of her sitting at Studio 54 with Halston, uh, with, with Liza on one side and Elizabeth Taylor on one side. And they're all three of them are wearing things that I had drawn with Andy Warhol. So it was so cool that I was actually sitting at my desk drawing poppies that Halston had said to me that let's take Warhol. And Warhol at that time was not so famous like he is now. And he and Halston were great friends. So they would share art ideas. So now I'm supposed to draw Andy Warhol's poppies on the dresses and then we would have them embroidered. And I felt like somebody was behind me. And I had no idea who Warhol was because I grew up in India. Right. Then I, then this man is standing behind me with a big white wig. And he says to me, hi, I'm Andy. And I said, okay. He's saying, I know you're Naeem. You are Naeem. You are Halston's new assistant. And I, you're drawing my poppies. Let me show you how to draw them. He and I sat and we drew poppies. And we would sit and have so many conversations. And how to think. Look at a flower. What do you see in a flower? Why do you... What do you see? I, I, would, I would think that I see a flower. He's saying, no, look beyond. Look at the petal. Look at the shades that are falling on the petal. Look at the center. So from that one flower, we would design a thousand things. Andy and, Warhol is showing you how to think outside the box and be yeah. more creative. That's wild. But you know, Elliot, I had no idea who these people were. I had no idea that I was part of history. I had no idea that this would become what it became. So when you were in those days in Studio 54, mm -hmm. you would sit there and you were, it's not like you were in the middle of dancing, like you were watching to see what was going on with culture, what people were wearing. Absolutely, you used to hang out there a lot. And so it was a place to socialize, plus also to be, you know, studying what's going on, um, how clothes move and creative people at Studio 54 were, were incredible, you know? Uh, I mean, Warhol was there all the time. Halston was there. Liza used to be there. Bianca Jagger used to be there. There were so many amazing people. Another thing that really, really helped me 
Diana Vreeland used to be the director of the Metropolitan Fashion Division. So she used to come to visit Halston and she was such a legend at that time. And she loved India. And she used to call me, like, she used to love me. So she used to say, Naeem, you have to come to the Met. And I want you to pull out any drawer you want and look at all the vintage historical clothes that are there. So I used to sit there at the Met with all those vintage clothes from amazing Balenciaga to Norel and all the great, great fashion people. And I used to draw them. And I used to come back to Hawson and say, this is what I saw. So it was so amazing that not only did it open my mind, but also it taught me how to draw the textiles, working with Warhol, hanging around with Elizabeth Taylor, um, Martha Graham, you know, like it was such amazing, wonderful artistic characters who were part of his, you know, social circle. He, his business was tremendous. We were doing a billion dollars a year. He was a great artist and a great businessman and a great man. I mean, he and I had the, the best relationship and he really took care of me and we made great business together. So this is like a sum up of my summary of my life, but this taught me so many things. I had quit Halston after two and a half years because I couldn't take it anymore. That time was a bit of a wild time and I did not want to get influenced by all that. I left because I just wanted a life around much saner environment, right? Was that hard to leave? I mean, that Very was hard such because, a great opportunity. Of course, but it was either my life or I would you look at other people who stuck in that world and today don't, they're not alive. They died of AIDS or have not been successful. I think I'd left at the right time. He was very upset with me because I was leaving. He really believed that I could be his golden child, like, you know, golden uh, apprentice, but uh, I couldn't. And, uh, I left to go to Los Angeles because I didn't want to be here. So you open up, you started this label named after your mother. Yes, the name Riazi, my mother's name. I made that name the company because I felt the love of my mother, that she would protect me. So I go to LA, I get myself a studio. I'm on Rodeo Drive on the second floor of this beautiful office that I had, Frank Lloyd Wright. And I started my design house and I hired Francesca Hilton, daughter of Jaja Gabor, to be my PR. And I had amazing people. Great. Frank Sinatra would come in with Barbara Sinatra. Gregory Peck would walk in with Veronique Peck. And I was making dresses for all these amazing Hollywood people, right? And they're paying you? No, they're not paying me. And that was the biggest disaster. Everybody wanted a discount and then take this and do that. And in eight months, I had run my business down to the ground, to the point where I really, really didn't have any money to even pay for my rent or even to like when I'm at the grocery store. Is like, do I buy the $2 chicken or the $4 ch chicken? I mean, it had become to that point. And I was like, what am I gonna do? I left my amazing job. I went and started my studio thinking I know everything. And I'm calling my father like, you know, dad, I need, my father saying, do what you have to do. Like, they didn't want to have anything to do with me. But they were pissed with me that I had like really run the family name. Here's my heritage grandfather and my father. And the son is now taking it. Like, I said, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> so I come to New York. I meet with an agent. His name was Cosmo. And he says, Naeem, you have such great history. I will quit my job and I'll become your agent and I'll invest and open a studio and you will be the designer and I will take 15% of all the sales. A huge amount, by the way. Then I give him, I design 22 pieces. I give him the collection. The first season, he books me a million dollars. Now I have a million dollars worth of orders. You and need I have, capital to make. I have 5,000 in my bank. Right. <laughs> 
calls, who do you call? And as I first I go to the bank and the banks are like, sir, it doesn't work this way. <laughs> right. and, oh my God, nobody's getting the money to produce. I have to buy the goods, I have to buy the fabrics, I have to do all that. So I call up my dad and my dad, of course, and then everybody became like, okay, he's putting himself back together again, slowly redeeming myself. <laughs> Give him another shot. Give him another shot. No, it's not like that. They were like so happy. Everybody cried. Everybody made up. We missed you. And uh, then my dad loaned me 300,000 and I had that money to start my business. And I used that money to now sold all the goods. I used to not only design, the stuff would pre-pack and arrive. I would pack the goods myself to ship to the stores. My wife and I would carry the boxes to the UPS truck. That's how we did that for two years. So now we were making such a huge amount of profit. We, I returned the money to my dad and my dad, of course, didn't want to take any interest to anything with the family. And now I'm like a million dollars in my bank account happy. Of course, then I bought a house in Connecticut, I bought a fancy <laughs> car, and I'm living my life, right? And from then on, it has been a journey for me. Till in 2003, finally, I felt that I was ready to go and make Naeem Khan me. And what what made you feel that way? I just felt that I had learned enough that I did not want Naeem Khan from day one, because what happens if I falter? And if I destroy that name, like what happened to me in LA? And nobody would want Naeem Khan as a brand. Right. So I wanted Riazi as, as the brand. Let me practice with that first. So 14 years I practiced and I understood logistics. I understood manufacturing. I understood my relationship with the stores. I understood all that stuff. And now I, I was ready in 2003 to come and have my first fashion show under Naeem Khan. What did that feel like? Incredible. For the first three years, I was so nervous during the show that I used to have fever the night before and the fever after the show for two days, I couldn't get out of bed because it's like, you're presenting yourself in front of the most important people in the world and saying, this is who I am. It was a nerve wrecking experience. Now you can put me anywhere and I don't give a damn. I mean, I, I, yeah. I'm like, you know, it's like, I've done it so many times. So uh, not only did they not say anything bad about you, on the contrary, I heard a quote that there's no show like, like a Naeem Khan show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like an Indian wedding, right? I love drama. I like, but drama with taste, obviously. Like, you know, my days with Warhol working with, you know, foil or something like doing giant foil balloons, or it could be a forest, uh, you know, like nymphs coming out of the forest. One year I got so into graffiti that I liked this man in Miami who does these giant murals, which are like the size of a building. So I said, okay, how fast can you make a mural? He said, I can make a mural in like four hours, size of a two-story building. I said, okay. So we had curtains, the curtain opens, and there's a man on a ladder with spray cans painting this amazing mural live. While you are coming into the show and you're sitting down, That's there's a so man cool. painting. And then the lights go down. There's the fashion show is about to start. And the spot goes on the man. And with the spray can, he writes Naeem Khan. Wow. And then he leaves and then the girls start to come up. So you see why there's no That's show cool. like Naeem Khan. That's cool. <laughs> it's all drama, right? So there's a very specific breakthrough moment in your career that I think it's important to talk about. Mm -hmm. You might know what I'm going to say. It was in 2009. Mrs. Obama. He misses Obama. <laughs> oh my God. There is a crazy story though, which I want to tell you. When I was young, I must have been 15, 16, and I was dating somebody in India, my girlfriend. And I was telling her that I'm going, to, I think I'm going to go to America. And uh, my father's thinking this. And we were talking about like, I want to be in fashion. And I said, one day I'm going to design a dress for the first lady of the United States. <laughs> and um, 
forgot about that. Life goes on. 2000, whatever, nine, right? I get a call. First day dinner, Indian Prime Minister coming. Mrs. Obama wants to wear your dress. You have two weeks. Two weeks? Oh my God, measurements. Can't give you measurements because cannot release measurements of the first day. So how are you gonna... Because being in the business for so long, you understand from a photo, I can take the division of your face and that becomes my average and I can multiply the rest of your body. Wow. It took me a few days to think, how am I going to do this? My history, what, what is it going to be? So I took my time at Warhol, like with Warhol. So I took the poppies, inspired by poppies, not copied by right. poppies, and drew them on a style which was very simple, clean, Halston a la Marilyn Monroe. Happy birthday, Mr. President. Put nude, like a champagne color tool, drew the poppy, send it to my, had somebody get on the plane, go to India, sit there. But what embroidery do I want on the poppies? My grandfather's workshop with a hundred people making metal sequins from sterling silver. And when they cut it, they punch it by hand, each sequin. And the sound of hundred people, tick, tock, 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 stuck in my head as, as an adult now. Okay, I said, I want that technique. So I had them take those sterling silver from my grandfather's time and put it on the Warhol poppies. Wow. And the shape is a very Halston shape. And I made a dress that fit her like a glove on the first shot. I'm in Miami. I am in my bedroom watching TV for, the in, for that state dinner, hoping something will happen. Nothing happened, nothing happened. I go for a shower. My wife comes screaming, oh my God, she's wearing your dress. I'm in my towel with water dripping down, me standing there in front of the TV and watching the dress. And I'm saying, oh my God. Next thing, five minutes later, my phone rings. Hi, my PR, CNN wants to talk to you. Get ready, car's coming to pick you up. Boom, I'm at the CNN office. Larry King, all these people. What's going to happen to Naeem's career? Naeem, what do you think? I'm like, oh my God. It was just the most <laughs> insane moment. Next thing you see in the morning, there is all press at the bottom of my building. I mean, it was insane. I was on every cover, every magazine across the world. You know, one thing in your life can change your career. And that was my most important moment. And I hope I have some more other great moments, but that was one of them. What, and, what, did, what did you feel like that day? Oh my God. You know, it's the most incredible feeling ever. I was thinking of my time sitting there with my girlfriend saying, I want to design that dress for the first lady. And look how it happened. I mean, I could not stop beaming for the next week. And that next day, you were the third most Googled person in the world. <laughs> exactly. That's crazy. And she wasn't the only first lady. No. Then it was, you know, Duchess of this and... Kate Middleton, Duchess Kate of Middleton, Cambridge. Kate Middleton, Duchess of Cambridge. When I saw the list of celebrities that you've dressed, I was like, J-Lo, Taylor Swift, Beyonce, like all of these women wearing your gowns. You know, it's, a, it's been a great ride. So how has your business changed after Michelle Obama wore your dress? The business changed a lot. I mean, it became 10 times bigger. Uh, we were in many, many stores across the world. From 80 stores, we were now in 200 stores. And, um, and now, you know, business became bigger and obviously, you know, volume, production, everything increases. But my business is not a kind of business that you can be having a private plane and it's not a mass, it's not Ralph Lauren. So in order to make giant money in my business is having a volume business. And you cannot do it with the clothes I make. Let's talk about the process. Mm -hmm. There's so many people involved. Mm -hmm. There's a few different countries involved in yeah. every single piece. Yeah. So how does it start? So obviously it starts with an idea that I have. And every piece that I make or every embroidery that is there is drawn by me, right? So the way it starts is like this. I wake up in the morning with 10 ideas. Now you start making the patterns. I fly to India. 
And I actually create the embroideries myself with my artisans and my team, right? How much glass do you put? How much plastic do you put? How much thread do you put? And then those patterns that I created at the board, I start putting those embroideries into those patterns. It goes to my factories in India. Then, but the fabric comes from Europe. And sometimes the fabric can be from two different places. Let's say the tool is coming from Paris and the organza is coming from Italy and we are patching the two together. And the beads are from right. Czechoslovakia and the crystals are from Austria and the artisans will start embroidering. Usually on a dress, you have between 15 to 20 people on one dress. So imagine I'm making a collection of 100 pieces. How many people do I need? And I have to get it done all in three weeks. And then it comes here and then my team assembles it here. I have a, like about 30, 40 people in my office here. And it becomes a reality and we can show it on the runway. And the fashion shows are huge. You have about three, 400 people involved in the fashion show. 50 models, 80 dressers. You know, I mean, it just is insane that the thing is a zoo. And, and then you start selling. Wow. You employ thousands of people. Yes. Now, your company, you've had many offers to sell your company mm -hmm. and you rejected all of them. You mm -hmm. retain 100% equity. Mm -hmm. What's your mindset when it comes to that? Look, some people can say that how I think is wrong. My thought is very different. My thought is the quality of my existence, it has to be better than the amount of money I have. And what this business provides me is an incredible life of pleasure that I get from designing and having this fanciful, fantastic, creative business that makes me so happy. And now your wife was from the same city as you, but you didn't know her growing up. No. So we went to the same school. She is three years older than me. But you know, when you are 15 and she's 18, 19, she doesn't give a damn for you, for right. a kid. So I used to look at her, she was gorgeous, and she was the number one athlete in school, so she used to win all the championships. I read that you were captain of your sports team. You loved playing cricket. Yes, when I started to win, she noticed me, but we didn't, but I was younger. So then after school, she left to go to college and became a model. And she was number one model in India. So when I came to America, it so happened that she was supposed to get married to somebody and she came here and somehow she didn't like this, the man she was supposed to get married to. And her best friend, his younger brother is my best friend, but he was here and I was having a dinner and I had invited him and he said, can I bring her? That's how our wow. relationship started. And my first date, I spilled all my wine on her. I mean, it was like, I was so nervous. And she was like, who's this fool, this kid? <laughs> but you know, life is strange. You, you, you did something right. I did something right. But you know, you have to keep persevering. And I have always believed that if you have a dream and you wish for it and you, you go for it, you really can get it 90% of the time. And she was my dream. And so was the life I have right now. And I have made this dream. Do you want the same thing for your kids in this business? Yes. My grandfather helped my father. My father helped me to build my brand. Now I'm going to make sure that my sons carry the torch. That's beautiful. Yeah. What, what advice would you share to aspiring entrepreneurs? So it has been an amazing up and down journey, but I have kept the business small, very boutique, highly profitable, not being totally ambitious to the point where I can lose my shirt. No partners. I own 100% of the brand and I've built this business a brick at a time. But in order to create this golden brand, it's taken me 40 years and there have been many years where you take one step forward and 10 step backwards but you just stick with the plan and you keep going i think we got to end on that Naeem, thank you so much you're, you're uh 
very humble man. Thank you. A family man. Thank you. And of course, a fashion icon. You're kind. Thank you. I'm so happy to be able to talk to you.